Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Computer History Museum. It's so good to have so many of you out here today, especially at a midday event. I'm John Holler, the President and CEO, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to this uh, midday soundbite, as we call them, and to welcome you on behalf of our trustees and our staff, our members, and our more than 200 volunteers. We are incredibly lucky to have Richard Curran with us today uh, because he is one of the nation's most distinguished historians. He is the Undersecretary of the Smithsonian for History, Art, and Culture, and what a job that is. Uh, first of all, he is responsible for the operation of many of our nation's great museums, including the Sackler Gallery and Freer Gallery of Art, the Cooper Hewitt uh, National Design Museum in New York, the Hirshhorn Museum of Sculpture, on the Mall there in Washington, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Museum of African Art, the National Museum of American History, uh, the National Museum of the American Indian, the National Portrait Gallery, I could go on and on. It's a big portfolio and Richard is responsible for essentially the content that goes on uh, in much of the Smithsonian which uh, makes him sort of a, a national chief content officer, which is about the coolest job I can think of. In addition to that, he has responsibilities for the Smithsonian Libraries and the Smithsonian Institution Archives. And if that's not enough to keep Richard busy, he is also responsible for the programmatic aspects of the Smithsonian Channel. If you watch the Smithsonian Channel, it's really a terrific uh, digital channel and that is a partnership between the Smithsonian and Showtime. But of course he's here today because he is the author of this amazing new book that's come out which is going to be a national treasure for a very long time, The History of America and 101 Objects. We're not going to go through all 101 today but we're going to cover a lot of ground in a little time and then also talk about some things that are happening at the Smithsonian that are more forward-looking. So please join me in welcoming Richard Curran. I want to talk to you just for a minute before we get into the objects, which I think are just so fascinating. Uh, I'd like for you to talk for a minute about how the Smithsonian came to be. I think it's one of the great acts of uh, forethought and generosity in the history of the country. Could you just tell that story for a moment? Sure, sure. How many people here have been to the Smithsonian? Okay, look at that. Wow. I'm these home. are your, these oh, are your these people, my peeps. Richard. Yes. <laughs> The, um, well, you know, the Smithsonian is named after a guy, James Smithson. Uh, and Smithson was the son of British aristocracy. He was illegitimate. He wasn't recognized. He was a little peeved at the Brits uh, because of the lack of recognition. He went to live in France. He was a scientist. He was a chemist. He was a mineralogist. He believed a lot in knowledge and, and progress of society at the time, Age of Enlightenment, late 1700s, early 1800s. He, um, he believed that somehow if you coupled knowledge with democracy, that was the recipe for a progressive society. Uh, he bet on the French Revolution. Didn't turn out so well. Uh, he made a lot of money early in canals, early railroad development. And when he was uh, in later life, 1826, he writes a will and he says, I leave to the United States of America my fortune to found in Washington an institution named the Smithsonian and dedicated to the increase and diffusion of knowledge. A lovely enlightenment phrase. Uh, he didn't have any heirs uh, and his money, he knew about Franklin, he knew about Benjamin Franklin, he knew about Thomas Jefferson, he knew about this, the importance of science and research and knowledge in, a, in, in what he looked across the ocean as a democratic society. Never lived here. Now, when he donated his money, when he died, his fortune was worth $508,000, which was equivalent to about $100 million today. And that all came to the U.S. Well, it was going to come to the U.S., but the U.S., uh, <laughs> nothing's never new. Congress argued for years over whether to take the money. <laughs> finally, the money came. They argued for another, what, uh, 11 years, and finally figured out to found the Smithsonian. So we're very grateful for, for James Smith, and I think he, would, he probably envisioned a scholarly society. I think he would have been amazed to find what the Smithsonian's become. But it was a, look at that, that was created not by the government, but as you say, I think what you're referring to, John, is a supreme act of philanthropy that helped kick off an amazing institution. Mm -hmm. And now, flash forward a couple of centuries, uh, it's known as the nation's attic, but it's far more than that, uh, and you've got uh, such a vast and enormous collection. I'd like for you to talk for a minute about 
how you take on a project like that to whittle down this vast collection into 101 objects, uh, especially with so many highly opinionated people and talented curators who have their own points of view wanting their object in the collection. Well, John, you know of what you speak, right? I mean, <laughs> so, you, know, you know, any director of a, of a museum has that issue when you're doing exhibitions or programs and so on. Smithsonian has 137 million objects. That doesn't count maybe 20 million photos and millions of miles of uh, archives as well. Uh, and yet, I felt it was very important to do a project. Uh, this is based on uh, Neil McGregor, the head of British Museum, did a book about two years ago, 100 Objects of World History from the British Museum. The, the very successful, the publisher of that got in touch with me and said, you know, Richard, we need something for America. We don't teach our history anymore in our schools. Our, our people in our country were more diverse than we've ever before. We don't teach history in the schools. We need to know who we are. We need to do one on American history. So he said, of course. I also said, well, they did 100, right, the Brits? We need to do 101 for Americans. <laughs> So, um, okay, getting down from 137 to 101 is not an easy task. And as you can imagine, when you put out the word among my colleagues, fellow curators, hey, make your suggestions. Okay, so if you're a curator, a philatelist in the National Postal Museum, what do you recommend? Well, they recommended 100 stamps. They, they left me one, you know, like, oh, you want to do something George Washington, go ahead, but 100, 100 stamps. And the portrait gallery had portraits and so on. But I let the curators kind of make suggestions. Well, I, I think the most important thing I did is, you know, for all of you who visited the Smithsonian, we get 30 million people a year who come to the Smithsonian. People gravitate towards certain things. They want to see the Star Spangled Banner. They want to see Lincoln's hat. They want to see Neil Armstrong's spacesuit. They want to see Julia Child kitchen. They want to see Jackie Kennedy's inaugural dress. And so I included things that the American people uh, uh, see when they visit the Smithsonian. And then finally, I wanted to include a few surprises, a few things people don't know. Because John, you know full well about the Smithsonian, but most Americans don't realize. You know, we have 500 scientists in Panama doing tropical biology. We have 350 astro physicists looking at other planets and you know and and and, and the big bang theory and so on and so we have a lot of people doing behind the scenes research so i wanted to include some things that you would not see at the Smithsonian. I have include some things that have never been on in on exhibit at the Smithsonian to give that story of american history your own personal story is a kind of quintessential american story and in addition to your qualifications as a historian i think it's just marvelous that you, with your background, uh, have come to put this project together. Can you tell a little bit of your story, your parents, your love of museums, and how that all came to be? Well, um, I, you know, I'm not, I, I don't really talk about it that much, but uh, I'm a New York City kid, if you couldn't tell from the accent. The, um, uh, but my dad was a cab driver, a truck driver. My mom worked in the garment industry. I, you say, if you went, were ever in New York years ago and you saw the guys in the street with the racks of dresses, I used to do that, you know, as a part-time job going through college. But uh, I was in, uh, in college, and um, uh, it was during the 60s, remember the odd 60s, and a lot of demonstrations and stuff. And uh, I wanted to travel. A friend of mine said, let's go to India. And I had a professor who said, oh, you're going to India. You guys need money to go to India. I said, sure, we need money. How are we going to go to India? He said, well, you know, I, uh, he was an anthropologist. He said, I worked for this lady, and I collected stuff for the Museum of Natural History in New York, and maybe she'll give you a gig, too. Well, I thought that was great. And as a kid growing up in New York, again, the museums were free. They were the route into another world. I used to go to the Museum of Natural History all the time. I mean, it really opened up worlds. And whether you're interested in American history or natural history, science, art, it was there. It was a great resource, which is why I believe so strongly in museums and went up work for it. So I said, okay, who do I go see? What lady do I go see at the Museum of Natural History? She said, oh, Margaret Mead. So I said, okay. I, I, I didn't even know who Margaret Mead was. <laughs> at that point. But, but we went, we ended up getting passed off to the Indianists. I went to India, lived in a village in the Punjab for about six or seven months. I collected old looms and pots and pans. Of course, everybody local thought I was crazy. Why do you want my old pots and pans and beat up stuff? Uh, but I learned a lot and I learned what I didn't know. And I was like, you know that uh, Steinberg poster of New York, you know, where you see like 8th and 9th Avenue and then you see Japan and Russia and China in the background? I was that kid, very parochial. 
And I learned so much about what I didn't know. And so I got involved. I went to graduate school, University of Chicago, got my PhD in anthropology, worked a lot in India, in Pakistan, some in Afghanistan, which was all very good training for working in Washington. <laughs> And I uh, had the opportunity to work in, in, uh, at the Smithsonian as an intern and you know, then on contract work and thought, wow, I really love to do that. Taught at Hopkins for a while, but uh, really loved the idea that at the Smithsonian we take knowledge out of the seminar hall, so to speak, and you're, you're in the research community, but you're also doing knowledge in the public eye for the public good. And in my, in my career, there's been nothing like having that National Mall of the United States, you know, that area between the Capitol and the Lincoln Memorial, where you could do your programs, and again, you know, influencing or impacting or trying to inspire 30 million people a year who come to visit you. Know, that's, I think that's three times more than Disneyland. That's a lot of people. And if we could breed in people or, or, or influence in people a sense of inspiration, they want to learn more, again, about whatever field, I think that's a good role to play. So one final question about how this got put together, and then we're going to dive into the, okay. the items themselves. You, you whittled it down to slightly more than 100 items, and then I read that you personally made the final selections for the 101, and you put something in the book that said, one of your final criteria was that each object provide additional insight into how they, the objects, were understood and interpreted. What did you mean by using that, the, the understanding and interpretation of these objects as being one of the final filters that you used? Yeah, I didn't want it to just be a, you know, a, a list of celebrity objects you know, in, in that way. I mean, I wanted to use objects that were instructive in their own right. They told us something. They told us something about history. Or they told us about something about how something that was history that we took so important at one time and then went out of favor, or how something that we collected for one purpose in the 1800s had another purpose in the 1900s or in the 2000s. So uh, I, I wanted to use these objects as devices that would both connect us to history and tell stories. It's like when, you know, if we have a, 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 a if, when you see like Abraham Lincoln's hat, I mean, the idea that he wore it and you're standing there looking at it, <laughs> tells you a story and it, it connects you to history. First of all, you can see Lincoln's sweat stains literally on the hat. You, you know that? You, you're in the presence. It's like being in the presence of celebrity. You want to hug celebrity, you want to touch celebrity, at least be near it, whatever you want to connect to it. So I wanted to choose objects that you could connect to, but also had something interesting to convey. Mm, that's great. All right, with that introduction, let's get right to it. There's that amazing layout uh, that you were talking about, the Smithsonian on the National Mall. Yeah, it's pretty good real estate, I think. <laughs> it is pretty good real estate. Now, we're, uh, you know, I've learned that the great struggle in history is between theme and chronology, and the book is beautifully chronological, but today we're going to go through it a little bit thematically, and the first theme is some of the items that relate to the history of America, and of course this is just... Uh, seminal. It's the Declaration of Independence. Well, uh, here's what you could all do. You can all go home and see if you have the original. We don't have the original copy of the Declaration of Independence. Now, uh, if you recall in 1776, uh, on uh, July 2nd, the delegates uh, uh, said they were going to be independent. That's when they did the vote. And John Adams thought that would be a great national holiday. Everybody celebrates July 2nd. <laughs> Didn't happen that way. They would need to write out an explanation of why they were declaring independence. Thomas Jefferson did the drafting. We have the desk on which he drafted it. We have his notes, his draft at the Library of Congress. And then on July 4th, they had a piece of paper. Benjamin Franklin judiciously edited Jefferson. Thank goodness. And it turned, you know, here was a document everybody approved. They sent it across the street in Philadelphia to John Dunlop, the printer. He printed up a broadside. So the first copy of the Declaration of Independence that goes public is a printed copy, no signatures. It's just printed. The copy they approved that they gave to Dunlop, that original Declaration of Independence, is in somebody's attic or basement somewhere. You look at those old pictures, old picture frame, there's somebody in this country has the original. That, that's lost to history. A few weeks later, they did a calligraphy version of the Declaration. That's the one you see in the National Archives. That 
has been fa was fading, and by 1820, John Quincy Adams says, oh my God, we're going to lose the Declaration of Independence. He ordered a printer stone, this guy stone, to make, they didn't have photographs, they didn't have faxes, they didn't have, you know, picture anything. So what he did is he put a wet linen over that calligraphed Declaration of Independence, lifted it up, it took off more of the ink, mm. and he made an engraving. It took him three years. He, he was ordered by Congress to print 200 copies. Your William Stone in 1823, how many copies do you print? <laughs> Not 200, you print 201. <laughs> <laughs> so they distributed the 200, he saved the one, that's the printer's copy. Whenever your kids or you take, or your school teachers or whatever have those yellow parchment copies of the Declaration of Independence, it's based on that William Stone edition that was done and that's in the Smithsonian. That's fantastic. Now this is George Washington's uniform and sword. Uh, you have the actual uniform. Oh yeah, yeah, Washington was, uh, and we're gonna have to go through some of these I think pretty, pretty quickly. Sure. So this one, just, just, just very quickly, the sound bite on this is Washington did not want to be known as leading a ragtag bunch of American revolutionaries. He had very fine ideas about how to look like an officer and how the US Americans could look professional in the face of bread. So he really designed his uniform and that of other officers so we would look professional when facing the British. Now, this is an interesting story of preservation because you've recently had to take some steps to prolong the life of the Star Spangled Banner, but this is the actual Star Spangled Banner. Yeah, you know, it's on display in the American History Museum. I've taken a lot of world leaders, I've taken U.S. presidents through here, and when you, when you say, you know, this is the flag, this is the flag. Uh, this is the flag, uh, if, if you, uh, I don't know, it, it flew over Fort McHenry and was seen by Francis Scott Key on, on the morning of September 14th, 1814. This is when, after the bombs were bursting in air that night, he didn't know whether he'd see the British Union Jack or the American flag that morning. And if it was the Union Jack, this country would have been trouble. Baltimore is a key city, key port. Would have been a different country. And so this is the song he sings about. And most Americans these days, I mean, yesterday at football games, how many people singing, oh say, can you see, realize they're singing about this flag? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, when it, it was loved to death in the 1800s. When it came to the Smithsonian in 1907, it was in shreds and tatters. People cut out pieces of it. We had, a put, we had hired a seamstress who w invented a wonderful technique, put in 1.7 million stitches to save it, attach it to linen, by the 1990s, and maybe when some of you saw it hanging and so on, those stitches had stretched the fabric, they were ruining the flag. We had to take out 1.7 million stitches and do new conservation. And now it's on display at the Smithsonian. What I love about this also is we do, the, the War of 1812 was fought largely over the British failure to recognize American citizenship. They were impounding and pressing uh, Americans on ships. What we do now at the Smithsonian is we swear in new citizens in front of this flag, recognizing that act of citizenship. And on, uh, what is it, uh, Wednesday night, the president uh, will give the Medal of Honor uh, to Bill Clinton, Oprah Winfrey, Gloria Steinem, and others in, uh, in, in the presence of the Star Spangled Banner. It's terrific. Now, here's Lincoln's hat uh, that you were talking about a minute ago. I saw the Lincoln exhibition at the Smithsonian. Uh, two or three years ago, and it was so brilliantly done because you came around the corner and the entire room is black and all that you see lit in the case is Lincoln's top hat. It was really wonderful. I, you know, I talk about the hat because it, you know, it's certainly so iconic of Lincoln. T Lincoln was six foot four, tall guy. Wearing this top hat made him taller. A lot of his generals were upset at that. He made a better target to shoot at, and people did. Um, uh, there was no sizes, there was no standard sizes at the time, so it was custom made um, uh, uh, for, uh, for Lincoln as other hats were. It gave Lincoln respectability. Lincoln, remember when he was running for president, advertised himself as a guy from the frontier, but you had Prince Albert, uh, Albert uh, uh, Queen Victoria's husband wearing top hats. Top hats in America made Americans, this rough people from this rough frontier, look sophisticated. And Lincoln needed to be sophisticated to run the war. Uh, this hat was the hat that uh, he wore 
on April 14th, it was Good Friday, 1865, when he went to Ford's Theater, came into the theater, the play stopped, he got a standing ovation, Civil War just ended the week before, he put the hat down next to him, sat down and watched the play, and that when he, that's when he was assassinated. So this happens from that night. Special, if you look at the beginning, and this is where, the, the middle, and this is where material culture and museum people, you know, kind of try to add to history. You see that black mor band, that was a mourning band. He was the son of Willie uh, in the White House, 1862, passed away. So just as the country was mourning its sons in terms of the war, both North and South, Lincoln had this very public display of his mourning for his son. I didn't know you were going to tell uh, anything related to the Postal Museum, and it's, I just I included this because it was a postal artifact, and it it's a very special one. Can you talk a little bit about the history? Yeah, of this? just look at that. Look at the date. Can you make out the date? It's backwards, you know, as postal stamps are, so it appears right side when it's stamped. December sixth, eighteen uh, nineteen forty one. This was uh, recovered from the USS Oklahoma that was sunk at Pearl Harbor. The people who used this stamp in that st postal office on ship were in the ship in the morning. They didn't get a chance to change the date uh, when the uh, bomb struck. We have a couple of other World War II items here. First of all, this, uh, the famous uh, uh, picture here, thinking of loved one which is emblematic of uh, Japanese internment. Yeah, I'm doing a thing. Uh, tomorrow I have an event for Dan Inouye. Dan Inouye was a good friend, great supporter of, uh, of the Smithsonian and other institutions, and you know, won the Medal of Honor for his country serving in the 442 in World War II, Japanese American. And um, so this one really rings home to me because this is a depiction of a woman in an in internment camp with her infant obviously looking at her husband who's serving in the 442. And she's there, he's fighting for democracy and our war, and yet she's sitting there in a camp with a guard tower. Of course, the whole internment program was ended up being started by Roosevelt, but ended up being uh, ruled unconstitutional. But, um, you know, it's an important chapter in our national history. And in the book, I don't shy away from some of the difficult chapters in our, in our history. We'll come on a couple of those in a minute. Now, we think we have some large objects. I mean, we think the SAGE computer system is a big object for us to have to take care of, but here's the actual Enola Gay. Yeah, and this is, of course, the bomber that uh, dropped the uh, atom bomb on uh, Hiroshima, uh, and, um, you know, which was the subject of a good bit of controversy when it was going to be displayed in the Smithsonian. And in the book, again, I, I try to give the behind the scenes and a sense of, you know, history is not made only when, you know, obviously the Enola Gay had a huge impact on, on, on lives and the war uh, in our history, but also these objects have second lives within the museums in terms of how we display them, how they're understood and the kind of contentious attitudes about them sometimes. So this was the subject of a good deal of contention in 1995, and I talk about that in the book. Mm. Moving on, another sort of post-World War II item, an actual fallout shelter. Yeah, it's pretty aesthetically stark, isn't it? <laughs> I remember those old Twilight, ver you know, Twilight Zone uh, episodes with fallout shelters, and uh, but we have one at the Smithsonian, and again, it tells the story of what we as Americans were, you know, going through, and the, you know, the the uncertainty and anxiety. I know growing up in New York at that time, you know, there were always front page, you know, stories in the the paper about, you know, it only takes 19 minutes you know, for an ICBM to, for Russia to la launch uh, an attack and hit New York. And I was always thinking, okay, how much time does that give me to get to my brother and, you know, to hide and stuff. So it was really part of American consciousness. Uh, we got this from uh, a couple in Indiana, and it's uh, on display. And it, it tells, it helps tell the story of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of an iconic image, isn't it? In, yeah. Uh, the history of civil rights in this country. A, a, a very tough one, and there's been various uh, instant uh, uh, reincarnations of the Ku Klux Klan. I think we're in the fourth one now, uh, started after the uh, Civil War, and certainly it's a uh, heyday uh, in the uh, era of Reconstruction, and then again in the, uh, really in the 1920s. Um, and, you know, when you realize that the Klansmen were walking down Pennsylvania Avenue, 
and, and in robes and yeah, hoods. Yeah, I mean it's pretty pretty amazing, and it's still part of our heritage. And you know, right now we have uh, under construction a National Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, and that helps tell the story of uh, not only slavery in this country, achievement, uh, overcoming. Uh, you know, the kind of prejudices and the kind of uh, things that people have had to do. Uh, and it's, it, you know, it's totally an American story. Now you talked a minute ago about the inaugural gowns and the exhibition of all the inaugural gowns of the First Ladies was absolutely brilliant. And you could almost tell by the way people uh, had, had worn the area in front of this case that everyone was stopping here to see Jackie Kennedy's inaugural ball gown. Yeah, and I expect uh, more so, you know, this week because of the uh, anniversary of the um, assassination. Um, I'm, I'm a, oh, I mean, I also played football. I'm a guy. I'm not really. I'm, I'm, I'm not really that into fashion. <laughs> but I look at this gown and I say, you know, this 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 speaks of elegance. And you get the sense of youthfulness that Jackie Kennedy and President Kennedy brought to the presidency uh, at that time in the, you know, in the, in the 1960s, a young uh, couple. And um, uh, I um, uh, intersected with Jackie Kennedy a few times in my career at the Smithsonian. She turned, you know, she's a great supporter. She helped us out. She also made us give up something to Charles de Gaulle for a while, so. <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, um, in uh, 1962, you know, Jackie Kennedy really loved French, French uh, stuff and, and uh, French background and uh, roots. And um, in 1960, you all heard Charles de Gaulle, right? Remember Charles de Gaulle? <laughs> you remember Napoleon? Okay, well. <laughs> So in 1792, the, there was some the French Revolution. There was the blue diamond of the French crown jewels that was stolen. It was the second most valuable the crown jewel of Louis the 16th. It w was stolen and in the ensuing years Napoleon tried to get it back to reunite the French crown jewels and couldn't. That blue diamond ended up in England, it ended up in Harry Winston's at Fifth Avenue in New York, and it ended up at the Smithsonian. It was called the Hope Diamond. Okay? And so de Gaulle wanted to do what Napoleon could not. He wanted to reunite the French crown jewels and get that blue diamond back. So he asked for the loan of the Hope Diamond for an exhibit at the Louvre. Well, we're, you know, we're curators, we care about history, but we're also not dumb. <laughs> you know, so we were, you know, we said, no, we're not gonna give it back to the French, you know, even on loan, sure, 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 they'll end up taking it. <laughs> and so Jackie Kennedy was really persistent and said, I would really like you to give the Buddha. Well, that, the, the, the head of the Smithsonian, you know, was really nervous. Uh, and he called his, the head of the Smithsonian, the chancellor of the Smithsonian, is the chief justice of the Supreme Court. He called a guy that came from California, a guy named Earl Warren. And he said, do we have to listen, do I have to listen to Jackie Kennedy? Just imagine making that call. <laughs> he said, I think you do. So the Smithsonian, back to the curators, what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? So we only do what comes natural to curators in a situation like this. You take a hostage. <laughs> right, that's so you took De Gaulle hostage over Museum the Museum uh... 101? No, we didn't take De Gaulle hostage. And Jackie Kennedy engineered it. And so we sent the Hope Diamond to the Louvre in 1962. And the French sent us our hostage, a wonderful lady with an enigmatic smile by the name of Mona Lisa. That's wonderful. And how long did that uh, prisoner exchange last? <laughs> uh, Mona, Mona Lisa was here in, uh, in, both in Washington and in New York at the, at, at the National Gallery of Art and at the Met. That's for, fascinating. Uh, weeks. Now this is so iconic. And uh, you know, just as a piece of contemporary design, it's amazing because every spacesuit after this, of course there were many before it too, have all looked just like this. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a wonderful way of not only telling the story, but memorializing what astronauts have done. Well, I love this for, for really two reasons. Uh, one is that, you know, it, look, whoever dreamed generations ago that human beings would walk on the moon? I mean, you know, so, so the fact that this is the, this is the spacesuit that enabled uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin to walk on the moon, that's an amazing thing. It's an amazing scientific, technological, innovation, innovative uh, uh, achievement. 
The other reason I like this is because it shows how innovation and creativity come from all quarters, even unexpected ones. So in 19, uh, the, the original spacesuits were designed by, it was a guy thing. The idea was that they would be out of fiberglass and aluminum and heavy and impervious. And it was like when I was a kid going ice skating in New York, my mother would dress me up, you then couldn't move, right? So it didn't work. So NASA holds a competition in the early 60s to open up. They say, you know, these astronauts are going to have to move on the, on, on, the, on the moon. We need something with a little more flexibility. They hold a design competition. Who wins? International Latex Corporation, better known as Playtex. So there's a great, there was a great commentary, it was a good book on this by a, a Berkeley professor of fashion and design looking at this, but uh, a wonderful comment by a reporter who said, ah, so Neil Armstrong took a giant step for mankind and an even bigger step for ladies, girdles, and underwear. <laughs> but it was really, it was the layers and the flexibility and the movement. And so to think of that one of our greatest technological innovations came from you know a quarter you would have never expected, I think is a great story. That's a great story. So the final slide in the Americana section is this one, uh, Julia Child's kitchen. Now how did it come to pass that the Smithsonian wound up with Julia Child's kitchen? Uh, Julia Child uh, served in the OSS during World War II and she served with the guy who hired me for the Smithsonian, Dylan Ripley. They served together in Ceylon, Sri Lanka. Uh, so she was kind of partial to the Smithsonian. Our curators knew that she was moving from back from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Santa Barbara. Uh, her husband Paul had uh, passed away. Uh, we wanted to do something on food in America and Julia Child, you know, the whole notion of French cooking but also cracking the, the gender line in terms of uh, uh, extraordinary chefs. So we got in touch with Julia. A lot of her people said, no, this should go, something should go to the Smithsonian. Our curators, Raina Green, Paula Johnson, Nancy Davis said, okay, we'll go up, we'll visit Julia Child, we'll do some oral history, and we'll collect what? Pots, pans, some stirs and spoons, something like that. Well, they ended up going to her kitchen. Her husband, Paul, had designed it. She had really cured, they found she was the curator of her, collection, of her kitchen. Everything had a play. She had stuff cataloged. It was really stories behind everything. So they figured after doing the interviews, after checking out the kitchen, they had to collect not a few pots and pans, they had to collect the whole kitchen, including the kitchen sink. <laughs> and so that's what we ended up doing. And uh, you know, she was very great about it, and very gracious about it. It was a very, very popular exhibit at the Smithsonian. That's great. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the West. And one of the things you told me is you were going across the country. People are always fascinated with what's happened in their hometowns or in their region or locally. So let's look at some of the things that you have about the West. This is Lewis and Clark's pocket compass. Yeah, this is the actual compass. It was made for $5 in Philadelphia. And Lewis and Clark did a lot of dead reckoning as they traveled. They made maps. Thomas Jefferson made sure that they got instruction from some of the key scientists of the day. And so this is indeed the actual compass that got them across the country. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, this is it. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. Followed by the Conestoga wagon. Yeah, which was largely used in trade in the east down the Appalachians, but then was adopted into the prairie schooner and got people to California and yeah. Oregon and other places. And then this wonderful beer stats uh, painting of the Sierra Nevada. You've got a tremendous amount of art that you could have chosen to depict the American West. What was it about this one that really was special? Well, this was, I think, Bierstadt's best painting. Uh, and, you know, he used it. He was a you know, great artist. And, you know, just the luminosity of it. It was really the making of the mythic West and the representation of the mythic West. And this is coming out of, really, the Civil War, where there's so much bloodshed and there's so much national disagreement. And, you know, the West kind of has almost a recuperative value, I think, for people in the, in, in, in the East and, and, and as a country. Now, 
Now, Bierstadt was also a showman. Not only was he a great artist, and this is a very big painting, uh, he used to, you know, people used to pay uh, 25 cents or 50 cents to see this painting. So he, you know, he had curtains and everything. He did a show, he'd unravel it. And remember, this was, while well, you had photography, it was, certainly wasn't in color. So these were the images that enticed many people. It may have even enticed some of your progenitors, some of your ancestors to come west. Very mythic. Colts revolver. Yeah, um, you know, uh, guns that won the West, uh, battling with, America, with Native Americans, uh, the war with uh, the, the cult actually comes out of the, the Patterson cult, the early cults come out of the, uh, uh, the, the Texas-Mexican wars. Um, and, you know, really the innovation was having these exploding caps and having a revolver. You would, you, you would have to reload still. The, the early cults, if you could see up there, you know, the whole idea is that you have you know, uh, uh, the revolver basically, part of it with the bullets in it, and then you could see you'd have spare revolvers. So you'd <laughs> reload the whole revolver. But that was better than the one-shot pistols that came before. And the Colt was made so that you could ride on ho horseback and it had enough stopping power. So, real, I mean, it was a huge innovation. Now you told me the story about showing this flake to selected guests who come to the Smithsonian for special events. Uh, what is it about this particular flake that you like to tell when you're taking out the white gloves and holding the flake and showing it? Yeah, well, you know, the flake on the screen looks pretty big. I mean, that would be a nice chunk of gold. In actuality, it's about, oh, one-fourth or one-fifth the size of your pinky nail. So it's tiny. What's so significant about this flake, this particular flake at the Smithsonian, is this is the flake that James Marshall saw that January at Sutter's Mill. This is the flake that started the California Gold Rush. And it was brought, uh, it was brought uh, by uh, uh, the, the military assayist, um, you know, across land and sea and horseback and so on to Washington and delivered to the President of the United States at that time, uh, uh, James Polk. Uh, and that, this was the flake that really started it all and, um, you know, was responsible a lot in many ways for, for California. It, it, you know, in this museum, what I also tell people nowadays when we look at it now, and I think it's particularly relevant in this museum is, you know, when you're dealing with small things, Small things can have huge consequences. Yeah, absolutely. This chip was so small, and when you think about the microchip, the computer chip, and so on, small things can have huge, huge consequences. Now, we have some slides relating to American culture, uh, and these are more contemporary, I think, than many of the things that we've been looking at. Let me just kind of go through these quickly, because we've got a technology session I want to be, section I want to be sure and get to as well. So here's uh, Mickey Mouse and Chuck Berry's guitar. Uh, a poster of Bob Dylan, Andy Warhol's Marilyn Monroe, an RCA television set circa 1939, 30, yeah, it's very World's early. Fair. Yeah, it, it, what I love about this, notice it. I mean, I, when I was a kid growing up in the 50s, we had TVs that kind of almost looked like that. that it was that Art Deco design, John Vassos, who, who designed these, uh, the, the design of it anyway, not the technology. But look at the television set. You did not watch the tube. You watched the reflection in a mirror. <laughs> A little different. <laughs> Catherine Hepburn's Oscars. Is the story behind this uh, Catherine Hepburn? Is it the existence of the Oscar? Is it the pervasive influence of Hollywood? I, I think it's Hollywood. I think it's, I mean, it's obviously her act, acting prowess and recognition, but I think it is really the making of, you know, Hollywood is the kind of the, the myth manufacturer of the United States. It's a, it's a place where our stories are made. And then finally, this one surprised me, uh, that you have R2-D2 and, and C-3PO in the collection. Uh, what was your thinking in selecting this? Well, I th you know, I mean, you know, Star Wars was a, a landmark film, and I think in this case, you know, in many depictions in science fiction and, and uh, you know, television and movies was that robots and technology was evil. And I think here we had the case where you had almost a comic duo. I mean, this was Laurel and Hardy. This was Abbott and Costello, right? 
I mean, this was a this was a routine. So I think it made technology friendly. It gave technology a personality. Uh, when we got this, we wrote to uh, George Lucas and asked him for the donation uh, of these. And of course, they use many for a film. These were actually costumes that actors got in. Uh, now we've kind of electrified them and automated them uh, at the Smithsonian. Uh, but I think they, you know, they marked a, a change in, I think, the attitude of, uh, of technology, attitude, popular attitudes toward technology. And an actual segue into in technology itself. So this is Eli Whitney's cotton gin. Now I'm sure many people have never seen an actual cotton gin. Yeah, and remember, gin stands for engine. Right? I mean, the whole idea was to help mechanize the process of picking those pesky uh, uh, seeds out of the cotton, which took a huge amount of time. And so uh, Eli Whitney is not the only one working at the time. Many people are trying to develop a solution to a problem, as often the case in innovation and of technology. There's a problem. People come up with all sorts of sometimes wacky, sometimes uh, uh, workable solutions. This was an amazing solution. He fought patent battles you know, for really two decades over this, over this machine. I think what he did not expect was the consequences of this. He was solving a technological problem, but this ended up creating a national issue and problem because the cotton gin led to the increased efficiency of cotton production, which required more slaves, which then led to the great expansion of slavery, the harshness of slavery, and to the Civil War. Now there's another cultural story behind this one because this is this is not just Singer's sewing machine, but there was an enormous impact in the way uh, women came into the workplace and the roles that they served at the time the machine was invented. Yeah, you know, think of you know uh, sweatshops, you know, which were the way you did it in handwork and people doing piecework, and so the, the the sewing machine was also a solution to a problem. Again, you had a lot more cotton. <laughs> And you'd have the development of looms, largely in New England, you know, as well as in Britain. So how to process all that? And the, sing the, 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 the sewing machine is, a, is the solution to a problem. How do you attach two pieces of cloth to each other? <laughs> and you could see, we have at the Smithsonian the different patent models within a two or three year period, at least these 16 different solutions to it. And of course, with the sewing machine, you started getting, you know, the, the, the factories, you know, the, the, the formal uh, uh, development of the sewing industry, the textile industry. It helped deal with immigration, the urbanization of uh, rural uh, folks to uh, cities. And it led, of course, to uh, women in the, uh, in the marketplace and in, the, in sewing. And then had another consequence because it also then devolved. The Singer sewing machine was first uh, invented for industrial commercial use but then it becomes part of the household crafts of, uh, of sewing. Uh, Martha Stewart did an interesting take, her take on the sewing machine in uh, this month's issue of uh, Smithsonian Magazine. I think it's fascinating too, just from the standpoint of running a museum, that as you said, you collected every patented version of a sewing machine within a two or three year period. And that's a debate we often find ourselves having here about how many versions of an integrated yeah. circuit or a desktop PC or a, a tablet are we going to have in order to have a, a complete collection. Yeah, and I guess, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of, I think, two kind of schools of thought. You know, one is encyclopedic. You know, have a sample of everything so you do it. And then, you know, the other one is, okay, do you have something so you can understand the thought processes the economic support, the social consequences of a chain of events that lead to something. And I, I, I think there's a good healthy debate mm -hmm. uh, about that. I think our, uh, our curators like to have everything. <laughs> <laughs> really? Our, co our collection managers are a little more judicious. <laughs> They sounds have to like, care for everything. Sounds like a everything. conversation we have from yeah. time to time as well. So the next three I wanted to put in just to reassure everyone that they're really there. There's the telegraph and the telephone and the light bulb. Uh, no controversy, I would guess, around putting any of these in, or was, or was there? No, not really, um, although the, these were all had their own controversies at the time in, in history, uh, certainly. Now here's Ford's Model T, 
uh, you could have selected any number of automobiles uh, in any any of any of Ford's designs. What was it about the Model T that really made this emblematic for you? Yeah, well, you know, the Model T. I mean, Ford ha did not invent the um, the assembly line uh, when it came to uh, you know the automotive industry, but he picked it up, and then he really developed the moving assembly line. You know, where you'd have teams working on on uh, so so uh, you know a car that took. Uh, hours to manufacture before we're really rolling off the assembly line in a matter of seconds. Uh, as Henry Ford said, he liked, you can get a Model T in any color as long as it's black. Uh, all, also very uh, efficient. This was one from the later, this is actually I think from 1926 at the end of the Model T era. But the Model T was wonderfully successful because it was so cheap. And it was cheap enough to be affordable by the workers of Ford. So, you know, at the early stages of Ford career, he's known, and you know, some of the issues with regard to unions. But at the early stages, he was very friendly to labor, and having a job at a Ford plant was a great, great, great job. It fueled a lot of the urban uh, urbanization of America. It was a job for new immigrants. Uh, Ford saw it as part of, uh, uh, you know, making people Americans, and. Um, you know, is an affordable car. You, you, you know, the price was down to I think two hundred and sixty dollars, and he sold you know millions of Model Ts. It really, if if you had Model Ts and you had cars, then you needed to make roads. If you need to make roads, you have labor, you have industry, you need steel, you need you know rubber, you need all that stuff. So it really was a, a, an item that helped build American industrialization. And that actually leads to a question that someone handed up, which is. Has there ever been any thought given to curating and displaying something like an assembly line, something that is massive like that, but has its own story behind the story? Yeah, and we've done we've done some things like that. Uh, we have uh, in the past. I don't think we have an assembly line up now, but we have had uh, uh, um, you know displays of at least pieces of assembly line or or pieces of an industrial process, so you could uh, uh, so you could see them and understand them in situ. Uh, the same thing we've done, like with Edison. Light bulb. We have several uh, uh, dozens of Edison's light bulb, and we have some of his notebooks. And the idea was to show the process of mm. experimentation, of trial and error. We have at the Smithsonian uh, the Lemelson Center for Understanding Innovation and Creativity, where our scholars, curators, fellows, you know, from across the country and across the world, study these th things very close up to understand how innovation happens. There are two planes. Obviously, the, the Wright brothers playing from Kitty Hawk and then the Spirit of St. Louis. Um, you could have chosen uh, any number of, of planes beyond these two. Uh, it's pretty obvious why these are emblematic and, and in them. But is there, a, is there a story behind either one of these that was even more compelling than something else you might have done? Well, you know, the Wright brothers, of course, because they, you know, it was an era, again, of great competition. They wrote the head of the Smithsonian, who himself was working on flight, a guy named Sam Langley, and they said, could you send me all your notes? And Langley was a very distinguished scientist, head of the Smithsonian in Washington, and here were two bicycle guys and, and writing to him, and he said, and, and the Wright said, we're not cranks, we have some ideas about flight. So the head of the Smithsonian sends him his notes. His plane goes into the drink in the Potomac, and there's flies. <laughs> After that ensued about 30 years of controversy. We almost did not get the Wright brothers' plane. They sent it to London. That's where it was during World War II. Charles Lindbergh helped mediate the disagreement between the Smithsonian and the Wright brothers over the representation of who was first in flight. Uh, so. You know, it tells the story of not only the accomplishment of the Wright brothers, which was really about controlled flight, but it also tells the story of controversy or have something that, that seems so simple and so non-controversy, yes. con controversial, can become the subject of uh, decades of action. Was Lindbergh also uh, a friend of the Smithsonian? Uh, he was. He was a great supporter. Of course, he had his own issues with regard to um, at least uh, uh, sympathy toward uh, Nazi Germany and, and, and issues there, uh, battles with uh, President Roosevelt mm -hmm. and so on. I use the spirit of St. Louis. I also kind of couple it. And the way in the book, I don't want to say, you don't want to hear that the undersecretary of the Smithsonian is cheating. But I kind of cheated a little 
in terms of telling the story of Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart at the same time. So I kind of combine, instead of having items of Amelia Earhart being, it would have been 102, it would have been a bad number. So I, I, I kind of, in the Lindbergh chapter on the Spirit of St. Louis, I really tell the story of both Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart. And it's really about the pioneering air veering, uh, of, of air flight. The Spirit of St. Louis, after it flew, made the New York-Paris run, went around this country, it was seen by about one quarter or one third of all Americans. And talk about the power of an exhibit, or museum, or whatever. Here was this plane that then was seen and touched by millions of Americans, and it is almost single-handedly responsible for popularizing the idea of air flight. Because people said, okay, now it's safe. Now, Amelia Earhart, it wasn't so safe. I'm always struck by how small it is, too, relative to everything else yeah. you can see in the Air and Space Museum. It looks incredibly fragile yeah. to have done what it did. Well, and he, you know, his big, the big issue there is he had to figure out how to carry enough fuel. You know, right. if you're doing a nonstop flight, you have to carry a lot of fuel, so you can't have a lot of extraneous weight or other parts in the plane. He couldn't see out the front window, by the way. Mm -hmm. Which was, I, I think people don't realize when you look at it, he could not see, he had to look out kind of a periscope to the side because of the, uh, the construction of the fuel tanks. Now, I don't think this is one I would have included for today's discussion until you told me the story of this camera when we, when we talked on the phone a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, th th this was one of the, you've, you've all heard, this is Bernice Palmer's Kodak Browning camera. Everybody who's, everybody's heard of Bernice Palmer, right? <laughs> Nobody's heard of Bernice Palmer. You all know Kodak Camera. Kodak Camera did what, kind of in the early 1900s, what our cell phones and iPads do today. It, it democratized our ability to document our experience, take a picture of things. This was, uh, Bernice Palmer was a 17-year-old uh, uh, girl, uh, originally from Canada. She wanted a brownie camera. She got a brownie camera for her birthday in early 1912. Her mother was going to take her on a cruise to Europe. They got on a ship called the Carpathia. They were out in Atlantic a few days. It got a distress call from another ship called the Titanic. So there's Bernice, Camus, uh, uh, Bernice Palmer, a 17-year-old with a camera. So she's the one that actually takes the picture of the iceberg that sunk the Titanic. It's a little hard to read in there. You see the arrow pointing to it. She's the one that takes the pictures of the survivors. She takes pictures with the rolls of film, and when it get, the Carpathia then docks in New York, it's her pictures that all the reporters and everybody screaming and gap, it's her pictures that go around the world to tell of this really you know, incredible uh, disaster and episode in our technological life. So uh, you know, it, it kind of showed the power of what a 17-year-old could do with a new form of technology. Here's another wonderful story, I think it's really lovely, which is Helen Keller's watch. Can you talk just a, for a minute about this? Yeah, this was actually started as another use. Um, this was used, this kind of watch, you see the device, the, 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 the uh, thing that drives the, uh, the hour and minute hand goes through the back, and these points on, around the, the watch actually tell. So Helen Keller could hold this and figure out whether it was 1.30 or 2 o'clock or about 2.15 or whatever by touch. This watch actually started out as a diplomat's watch, Swiss diplomat. If you're a diplomat and you are talking to the minister of what? It's kind of impolite to look at your watch. <laughs> so diplomats would use this to feel the time. <laughs> Mr. Minister, I have to go. <laughs> and you'd know. So there was a diplomat. He ended up working with Alexander Graham Bell uh, at a school for the, uh, for the deaf. And Alexander mm -hmm. Graham Bell did a lot in terms of uh, uh, working with uh, uh, the deaf. Uh, his mother uh, uh, was, his wife Mabel was, uh, was deaf. And so uh, he gave the watch to Helen Keller. She treasured it for her whole life. Now the last two are favorites here. First of all, the Smithsonian has been incredibly generous with its loan of panels of the ENIAC to put in our revolution exhibition and we were all delighted to see it as one of the objects in the in the in the overall story. Yeah, and it's a great story. It started out at the, you know, University of Pennsylvania in the engineering department and um, what was what was it 18,000 tubes vacuum That's tubes right. in it? I mean, just horrendous to 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 keep up. Uh, but it was really originally devised during when the contract was for World War II when people were trying to figure out the trajectory of artillery shells. 
and which is a complicated mathematical formula. You had some uh, uh, mechanical calculators up at Harvard, uh, other places people devising, and the ENIAC was originally slated to do that. Well, it came online too late to actually work, uh, but it was worked for uh, other, other programs. And then, um, you know, this occupied at the University of Pennsylvania School of Engineering, a room about, I don't know, 20 feet by 30 feet. And I think, I don't know whether it was Eric Schmidt or somebody in your video at the beginning said, you know, or, or maybe it was Ray Kurzweil from MIT, you know, yeah. the computers now are, you know, thousands of times more powerful and take up thousands of, ti uh, of, of uh, times less space. And the ENIAC is a great illustration of what, what it was like to be in a room with these. Jim Summers of our staff who's here today uh, gives a wonderful tour for school kids where he's trying to explain what the ENIAC did and he talks about the history of angry birds. Uh -huh. Because Angry Birds is based on the same principle of trying to get the trajectory of the bird right so that yeah. you can knock everything down. And they, that they understand. And then the final one is, of course, the Macintosh. And you were also very good in the book to include a picture of one of our artifacts, which is uh, one of the original Apple Ones. Yeah, the, um, uh, the, you know, just for perspective, and I cer you certainly get it from the museum, you know, the ENIAC, the people that worked the ENIAC said this was a computer you didn't work on, you worked in. Literally, you know, you stood inside of it. And remember, the original word for computers were ladies who, you know, were, were computers. By hand. They were doing computer by hand, so that's where it came from. Of course, the Apple and, and the PCs uh, uh, changed that. We were very happy we don't have everything. Even the Smithsonian with 137 million things doesn't have everything. And so we were grateful here for the Computer History uh, Museum, which had the, uh, has an original, uh, uh, um, you know, Apple One motherboard. Uh, that we're, So I was able to include that in the, um, uh, in the in the book, and um, you know, it's funny when you have you think about it for a minute, and you must have this all the time with this museum. We have it in our technology section at the Smithsonian. You know, you get kids, you know, kids coming in nowadays, and they'll look at that and say, "That's in a museum." Yeah. <laughs> you know, and why? Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know. It's not George Washington's sword, and I kind of recognize it, although it's a little old hat. <laughs> but. You know, you think about it 50 years from now or 100 years from now, and it's going to be, who knows what it'll look like, and it's very important to have the collecting going on now so you can have that perspective in the future. You also never know, and I'm sure it happens in this museum when school kids and others go through here, they see something from one era, and it inspires them to do something different in the future. You look at that Alexander Bell Graham telephone. And then you look at your own cell phone today and you go, wow. But the concept was the same. Oh, we believe in that. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you a couple of questions from the audience. We've got one more slide that uh, is more about the future. And then I want to play a little piece of video that talks about what the Smithsonian is doing. First of all, here's a really great question. And we get this kind of question all the time, too, about what we put out physically or in a book versus what we have. And it's, will the, the curator suggestions or the other list that you were going through making these decisions be put online at the Smithsonian? Will we ever get to find out the important things that maybe didn't make the cut? Um, yeah, I think, I think now we have the, the ones that are in the book. But actually, we have about 8 million digital records of things in the Smithsonian. And if you want to write your own book or put together your own list, if you go, you know, you could uh, Google Yahoo or Bing uh, Smithsonian collections. And you can have access to millions of items in the Smithsonian collection. And you can figure out what I lo left out, because um, <laughs> I left out a lot more than, than is in. Will there ever be a West Coast annex of the Smithsonian? I thought that's computer history. I was going to say, we can yeah, raise yeah, our hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, we, we're very grateful, because we do have this program of affiliate museums around the country. Uh, a number in the West Coast, uh, and, and the idea of an affiliate museum is that we'll lend things like ENIAC and other, uh, other objects. We'll do collaborative programming like this one, uh, and you form a kind of community of, um, of, of museums and collections. And increasingly, as things are digitized, I think it's more important to do that. Here's an interesting question about the Enola Gay, uh, going back to that for a minute. How, how radioactive, if at all, is the Enola Gay, and if there is some radioactivity on it, what do you do about that? Yeah, that, that, that's a great, great question. You know, we're very conscious of that. I think the short answer is no. 
Um, the, when we get an artifact like the Enola Gay, or even with the space shuttle Discovery, we clean it, or the space capsules and so on, we need to clean those things up. Uh, because they do off-gas, they have, you know, uh, Nola Gay, the question of radioactivity is, is, is pertinent, but in many other things you have all sorts of noxious gases because of the, the, the material composition of the artifact. Okay, so the discovery, uh, here was the good news. So the Smithsonian asked NASA, we regularly get things from NASA. Um, we, the Smithsonian, actually, NASA transferred Viking 1 mm -hmm. that's on Mars, mm -hmm. right? The, the one on Mars, that's now owned by the Smithsonian. We have to send a curator over there to dust it. <laughs> so NASA gives us things all the time. And uh, so we asked for, the, we knew the space shuttle program was coming to an end. We had the Enterprise, which was a test vehicle. We asked for the Discovery. The good news, they said, yes, we'll give you the Discovery, but you have to clean it up. Oh, what do you mean? You know, like dust? You know, no, you know, all this off-gassing, all this, the, 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 the bill for cleaning up the, the discovery was about $24 million. That would assure that we did not hurt visitors coming right. to the Smithsonian if it's on display. And so, uh, fortunately, we figured out something with NASA. We got them to, to do it, and uh, it's now on display at the Hazy Center. But we have to do that. We're very, very conscious of that. Uh, for all our artifacts. The Hazy Center is just fantastic. If you haven't seen that annex, which is out by Dulles Airport, uh, I really recommend it. It's definitely worth going to see. Uh, and that sort of leads me to ask you the, the final audience question, which is, uh, how, how does the Smithsonian make the case every year for the, the, the ongoing funding necessary to care for this collection and grow it and make it publicly available? Yeah. Well, I think with Congress, we have a lot of supporters, and really across the board. I mean, it's 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 quite bipartisan. We have a board of regents that has uh, Democrat and Republican members of both the House and Senate, the Vice President, Chief Justice, and and citizen members. Uh, we make the case. First of all, all of you own the Smithsonian. We all do as, as, as Americans, and we hold it in trust for human beings. It has a very strong, uh, as I've tried to get out of here, not only is it the items on display that are seen by 30 million people, which make it by far the most popular museum in the, in the world, it's true to Smithson's will. That's what he gave it to the United States, and the United States accepted that, that charge. So the fact that we can have this inspirational force that can influence all those people who come to Washington to visit or come to affiliate museums or see stuff online. I think that's a good thing. And the numbers are very big for the Smithsonian. So the, the, you know, the, the dollar per head served is great. The other thing is we have tremendous supporters of the Smithsonian. I have here two members of our national board, uh, Judy uh, Huret, who's the vice chair of our national board, and her husband, Bob. We have a lot of supporters at the Smithsonian, people who give of their time, their advice, and their treasure to help us do our work. So the Smithsonian, we take those federal dollars and we leverage a lot of private support. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we, we're very entrepreneurial. We, we generate millions of dollars through Smithsonian Magazine, our TV channel, and other things. We get grants. The Smithsonian actually runs six space satellites for NASA. <laughs> so we get contracts from the Department of Education, from NASA, from other things. Our, our people at the zoo. I mean, the zoo, I love the pandas. I really love the band. <laughs> but it's not just about displaying the animals, it's doing the work. So behind the scenes, what you don't see is our scientists working on the causes of avian flu and the vectors of avian flu, because we have bird collections, living birds and dead birds. And so there's a lot of research behind that gives the American people, and indeed the world, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of value. Let's talk about the future for just a minute. And there are so many things we could talk about, but there was an announcement that was made uh, just uh, a few days ago about the 3Dification about uh, yeah. the Smithsonian's collection and the possibility that one day we at home might be able to make 3D prints of some of these amazing artifacts. And there's a little piece of video that has okay. been posted on YouTube about that. I want to show that and then come back and sort okay. of give you the final word sure. about the future. So John, if you can show that video now, that would be great.
Here we are at the American History Museum. I'm standing in front of the gunboat Philadelphia. It was built in 1776. Uh, it was sunk that same year by the British. There were eight in total that were built, um, and those eight are often thought of as part of the beginning of America's Navy. So we're using a variety of 3D scanning tools, uh, some long range capturing the boat in its entirety at sort of medium resolution detail, and other very high resolution tools we're using uh, to capture some of the smaller bits of interest. The laser arm scanner has some very accurate encoders in each joint, and those encoders can tell the computer the exact position of this laser beam uh, in real time. So as we're scanning, we could see that, that bit of data popping up on screen. So we could see exactly what we've captured and what we haven't. Uh, so for objects that are geometrically complex or wherever there's really close quarters, uh, this is the ideal tool. And this data is gonna be used to support research at the Smithsonian, and it's also gonna be used as a public access tool. The gunboat itself is in very, very close quarters. So even if you're able to come to the Smithsonian in person, uh, you can only see a small portion of it. So that's part of the reason we're documenting this object in 3D. So we'll take that 3D model, put that online, so visitors uh, from the Smithsonian and also from around the world could explore this object in ways they simply could not, even if they were here in the gallery. We're here at Cornell University and their team is allowing us access to a high resolution micro CT scanner. The great thing about this technology is that we're able to study the interior and exterior geometry of an object in a non-destructive process. We're thinking that maybe we could offset the walls of the flower. Yes, if we zoom in... So this is an exciting example of coevolution between a Corianthes orchid and Euglossian bees. The male Euglossian bee falls into the bucket at which point its wings become wet and it won't be able to fly out the same way it came in. It's forced to travel out a small hole in the back where pollen is exchanged onto the male Euglossian bee. The male Euglossian bee now carries the scent of the orchid which attracts female Euglossian bees for reproduction. So once we have the CT data of the orchid, we'll be able to understand more thoroughly how the orchid and Euglossian bee interact. Whether it's a rare orchid, a historic gunboat, or an archaeological site, we see a huge potential to discover and diffuse knowledge through a variety of 3D scanning methods. And what we're really looking forward to is the future, watching this technology develop and apply this technology um, to the Smithsonian at a larger scale. How big is 3D technology going to be for the Smithsonian in the future? I think it's huge. It's uh, not easy to do. You know, when, when you think about digitizing, you know, paper, the thing with Google Books this uh, this week or last week about the settlement. You know, when you when you're digitizing flat pieces of paper, it's a little easier. When you're doing bees and orchids, or doing microscopic shrimp, or doing the space shuttle, or other things, it's a it's very complicated to both handle the objects, conserve them, and digitize them. It's a lot of work. But I think it's huge because it allows for several things to happen. One, I think using 3D imaging, we can actually put artifacts in the original context in situ in a gallery. You can create a 3D gallery and put objects in there to have a, you know, think of a, a cave in China that you can't see, you can't go to, you can't visit. We have the Buddhist statues. The caves don't have the Buddhist statues. The statues are in the museum. The cave is in China. We can join them both. That would be cool. I think the other thing is for um, uh, 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 research purposes, you can get and see things that you cannot see, th see, and we can open up our data set. If you think of the Smithsonian collection as a huge archive, of, of documentation of natural and cultural life on this planet, this opens up so some guy who's doing research in Sweden or Japan or South Africa, all of a sudden has access 
very detailed access to a collection, things you can't even see if you see the thing in person. And then finally is the reason for my wife, who's a school teacher, elementary school, public school. And she lives in Virginia. She could take her class to the Smithsonian to see these things. But if you're in Iowa, or you're in um, uh, uh, you know, Korea somewhere, or you're in Bolivia or Peru, you can't, or you won't. It's hard. And now a teacher could push a button, and you could have the Hope Diamond in your classroom. You can reprint 3D George Washington's sword or Benjamin Franklin's thing. Or you could even reprint the Space Shuttle Discovery as long as you remember to, produce, to push the reduce button before you start. <laughs> so, so the idea of bringing the Smithsonian's collection and making it far more accessible, I think, is good. And I think for education, using objects is always, I find, is a great way to get kids and people coming to a subject. Just like the American history here with this book. It's not about names and dates and things you've got to memorize. There's a way into it. So you look at a sewing machine and say, who made that? Why was it made? What consequence did it have? And it's a way of getting into, uh, into uh, science, into history, and into art uh, through objects that really grab your attention. Well, all of us at museums everywhere watch and admire so much this continual innovation process that the Smithsonian has. And eventually, it inspires us to uh, to work to do the same thing and to work with you as the great partner you are. So thank you very much for being with us today. Please join me in saying thank you to Richard Kern. Thank you.